since the dawning of time, man has yearned to break the shackles that bind him to earth and rise into the heavens above, to be with the birds and the clouds. He has been able to do so, to fly faster than the speed of sound, to journey to another planet, to stay aloft for days at a time. But until recently, the freedom of flight was restricted to a large, heavy piece of equipment that controlled the man more than he controlled it. Then came the graceful delta wing kites. Because of the nature of man, he must strive to do better, to compete, to reach the unknown. The art of kite flying has reached the plateau of competition. The scene for this confrontation was the National Delta Wing Kite Tournament, sanctioned by the American Water Ski Association and held at Cypress Gardens, Florida. Johnson Flex Wing Kites, Cypress Gardens, Florida. Lloyd's Gliders, Australia. Bennett's Delta Wing Kites from California. American Glider Ski Sails from Michigan. Combs Kites from Miami, Florida. The men who make the kites and the men who fly them have much in common. Since they're all flyers, they're all naturally interested in such things as lift, stress, climbing ability, and above all, safety. Each man has his own thoughts on how to fly the kite. The basics were the same, take off, climb, release, glide, and landing. Although the entrants in the tournament were all expert flyers, the landings were not always smooth. The boat and drive. The flight begins. The tow line snaps tight. The wind fills the big sail. And the kite man is off on another adventure, limited only by the length of the tow line. The men in the boat must coordinate with the kite man for a safe and successful flight. As the tow line is released, the most exciting part of the adventure begins. Man is free. Only the shifting of his weight and the pressure on the control bar in front of him control his descent. For the contest, he must make as many turns as possible. Stay up as long as possible and try to touch down in the center of the target area in order to score the maximum amount of points. While this landing was not particularly smooth, it was almost perfect in terms of scoring. Another release. Downward from out of the sky to win the prize in the water. Light and breeze, you know it ain't easy to touch the rain in the water. On shore, the watchful eyes of the judges score the landing, total up his time aloft, count the turns, and tally his complete score for the flight. 
Also of great consideration is the size of the flyer in relation to the square footage of his kite. A handicap system was used to assure that the lighter contestants would not have an unfair advantage over heavier entrants. always the utmost in the mind of the kite flyers, hence the frequent checks of the mechanism that releases the tow line from the kite. Of course, at an event such as this, not all that was worth watching was in the sky. As the tourney progressed, competition got tougher. The landings closer and closer to the center of the target area. Occasionally, they tried too hard to hit the bullseye. jolting results. Such as this delta wing kite that would never fly again. One by one, the competitors were eliminated. As the days passed, finally, there were only seven finalists. Paul Solovskoy, a Minnesota native, the eventual winner of the National Delta Wing Tourney, tells us how he did it. I think the whole thing behind this was the ability to fly over buildings and catch thermals because it keeps you up and you can stay up longer and crack up the, the seconds in the air and also uh, stay up longer and make more turns. I'm glad they allowed uh, certain contestants to fly over these buildings. It's dangerous and that if your kite comes apart, uh, you get a good bounce on the ground. But uh, riding these buildings and the heat coming off some of these buildings is the name of the game. And when you're riding out in the water, it's too cold to ride it well. And the secret is back behind me. Alexander of Orlando, Florida, as he made his final flight. Jim Laurie from Michigan flew the biggest kite in the contest. Dick Robbins came all the way from St. Paul, Minnesota to finish in the top seven. A sudden gust of wind carries Dick away from the target area. Lansing, Michigan, Dave Anderson told us about his flight plan. I decided to make a, a complete recopy of the, the uh, flight I'd had before, except I was going to add uh, or come in at the target the same direction that Paul did, because I've uh, all the way through the tournament, I've usually copied my flights after Paul, except that I have the uh, advantage in being able to stay at a higher altitude over these roofs with the thermals. Came out straight into the lake and hovered and then 
of course, banked it and right into the target. Max Combs of Miami describing his last flight. Pick up a nice, easy climb right now. Hang up there, right on the top of the line. Pull the release. Start into your turn. Maintain that speed. All right, first 360 is completed. See what the wind did. Try to compensate for the way the wind drifted me and then start on my next 360. Maintain that speed. Whoops, I'm a little bit high. I'll hold off just a second. Okay, now it's time to start. Start into the left turn. Keep making the left turn. Okay, now the last final 90, drop it in there on the target. Californian Bob Kennedy was to make the last flight of the day. Bob Kennedy, Mescadito, California. Kennedy's flight gave him enough points to finish fifth. This is Dick Robbins, fourth place. Dick Robbins Dick accepts Dick the Dick award Dick for fourth place. Thank you very much, sir. Hope to see you back again next year in the 1973 final. We'll be here. This is Max Combs from Miami, Florida. Max Combs seemed happy with his third place finish. finish. Well, I feel the tournament come out real good, and I'll be back next year, Herman. Dave Anderson. David Anderson, the runner-up, appeared relieved that it was all over. Um, it was real hard. I mean, it was really tough because uh, a lot of Kennedy flyers came through some really good flights, you know. And uh, I'm really nervous. I was nervous all day, and I can't wait to go and get something to eat. And the Florida Cypress Gardens oh, president, Dick Pope Jr., gave the national delta wing crown to Minnesotan Paul Solovskoy. I've never gotten out of watching anything, watching you fellows up there. And congratulations there, champ. So now you get the kisses. Yeah, I want this one. <laughs> uh, we want to keep her here with us there, by the way. Uh, but here's the trophy that goes along with it. Thank you. Congratulations. Challenge continues. Man against his nature. He must be free. He must fly farther. He must fly higher. The Delta Wings give him that chance. Freedom, exhilaration, a rush of cool, clean air against the face, open skies, and a whole world of pure joy stretch out below. Is this not as close as man can ever get to his friends, the birds? Sixty of the world's best kite men gather in Florida annually at Cypress Gardens for the World Cup Delta Glider Championships. The contestants have all qualified ahead of time for this final confrontation, a five-day tournament that tests nerve, stamina, and skill, a match among champions from far and near. In this new exciting sport, the competitors are towed to a height of 500 feet and then released from the tow line. In this phase of free flight, they're required to fly a varying pattern of turns. Once aloft and free of the tow line, the thrill of flight is imaginable only to those who have experienced it. The touch of the wind, the enveloping sense of quiet, 
a breathtaking panoramic view spread out below. And finally, the actual feeling of flight. Smooth, free, suspended in time. By a shifting of weight and pressure on the control bar, the flyer prepares for touchdown, skillfully making an often perfect landing on the minute target below. In tow launching, the flyer has two important partners, the towboat driver and the safety observer release man. Here we see a Johnson-powered outboard being prepared for the first phase of the flight. They all work together for the flyer's safety. Surface winds must be checked, and the speed of the boat must be adjusted accordingly. Knowledge, trust, and teamwork are essential for safe tow launch flying. Delta wing kite flying is still in its infancy. In 1970, an Australian, Bill Bennett, was the first to demonstrate the ability of this new type of kite flying by soaring to 2,000 feet, flying freely through space, and then making a perfect landing on the beach. Audiences gasp in amazement at the spectacle of skill and daring defiance of gravity. In August 1974, in the first World Delta Kite Flyer Championships, a 21-year-old Australian, Steve Moyes, won with perfect flying. Each year, more changes are made to refine the gliders. Improvements are being made constantly to increase the safety, accuracy, and freedom of the flight. Accuracy in performing as many patterns as possible and accuracy in hitting the target are the main factors used to determine the score. A perfect flight scores 1,000 points and a perfect landing scores 500. Despite the increasing skill of the flyers and the improved design of their flying equipment, not all flights are perfect. Here we see one of the most outstanding flyers in the sport, Steve Moyes on his takeoff. Moyes comes from Sydney, Australia, and has been flying since he was 14 years old. He has many titles to his credit on the national and international level. once pure flights of fantasy have become exhilarating reality for man as he enjoys the wide open space of free flight, released from the shackles of tow line and boat. Far above earthbound reality, both mind and body soar through a series of spine-tingling maneuvers. These seasoned pilots embody the dreams of early man, even back to Icarus, who in Greek legend flew close to the sun. Thus these kite men realize man's eternal desire to escape the bounds of Earth's gravity, to soar heavenward and blend with the wind and clouds. Surely there is no more graceful or exhilarating form of human flight than hang gliding. Floating freely below a wing that becomes so much an extension of the pilot that a mere shift of his body causes the kite to turn right or left and climb or dive. It's hard to imagine that this graceful form of flight is a direct descendant of the awkward kite show in this early Cypress Gardens film. 
The year, 1958. The place, Florida Cypress Gardens. A great new water sport was beginning to come of age. Sky skiing, a thrilling byproduct of water skiing. The Wright brothers of ski flying were Paul Updike and Vern Crary, credited with the first ski flights in Sacramento, California during the State Fair of 1951. But credit for advancing the sport definitely belongs to Cypress Gardens, Florida. One of those early pioneers was Richard Johnson, still an avid pilot and one of the 10 finalists in this world competition. Over the last few years, it's really developed a lot too, but uh, taking it sort of from year one, Back from before, we used to fly what we can call the flat kite or the standard kite. We started the Delta Wings in 1969, which was first started in the United States. And uh, that was right here at Cypress Garden, as a matter of fact. Back in the early days, we, were, we knew we wanted and needed a larger sail and that would glide longer and further. Of course, we want to stay in the air longer. But it, at that time, it wasn't safe. We weren't using the overhead release system and we weren't flying prone, which gives you an advantage. The kites are really safe uh, as compared to the old kites. Nothing is foolproof. Uh, it is considered a risky sport. But it's, it's so much safer today as opposed to five years ago that it's, it's phenomenal. There's, there's safety built into the kites that we didn't used to have. Dive recovery and so forth. There's a lot more people interested in the sport. Therefore, there's more intelligent people that come into the picture that have everybody donates a good idea, makes it safer. Uh, the kite controls better, responds better, and it's, you know, some hot more of a high-performance high machine. Of the 60 entrants from eight countries who began this competition, the largest group of pilots after the U.S. entries is the Australians. The Aussies are also the most successful in world competition. We talked to Steve Moyes, who won three of the previous six world championships. What would make you come all the way from Australia to compete again? Is this one of the biggest contests? Well, uh, Cypress Gardens put on the very first world championship ever on Earth in 1974. So we came to that because we wanted to uh, see how we, you know, meet other flyers and have a good time. And we've just been coming ever since because it's just been getting bigger and better. As is the case with many of the Australians, hang gliding is a family affair with the Moyes. You see, Steve's father designs and manufactures hang gliders. The number of Moyes maxi gliders in this world competition is great testimony to these gliders that were once thought to have mystical powers. What is Moyes magic? Well, that, that's a term given to, uh, to us because we've been, had a lot of success with competitions flying and just generally flying all over the world. The gliders that we make had uh, very good performance and when other gliders were going down uh, we were gaining altitude because we had a better sink rate so they thought it was magic because uh, it was something that they couldn't do that we were doing regularly but what does it feel like to step up to one of these kites hook into the harness grab the control bar and then be pulled into the air because we've had so much experience doing it it becomes almost like a reaction but for your very first tow launch. It's rather frightening. I don't know, it's just, it's just the greatest thrill in the world. It's something you could try to explain for a day. I, I could try to say, explain to you for a day. It to me? I, I could spend a day on it and it wouldn't be worth two seconds after you had a ride. sensation of leaving the ground and leaving the earth is uh, is the sensation that you feel be similar to taking off in an airplane except that you can feel the wind and you can actually look straight down you know it's a uh, you can really feel the height fast and uh, oh, it's a very unique feeling And it's just, it's a phenomenal feeling, especially when you're striding along and you do get a bump, a thermal or something, and just, you just start climbing maybe a thousand feet a minute. It's a real rush. But in tournament flying, these pilots have little time to wax philosophically about the joys of flying. 
There are three different segments or tasks to be completed by the pilots during competition. Each of the tasks involves completing as many prescribed maneuvers as possible, and then landing as close as they can to this target. As Chief Judge Stu McDonald explains, this makes for very objective judgments. We've taken the style pretty well out of this, uh, with that factor in mind, that this style is good. This style will result in a good fight anyway, but on the landings, we used to judge uh, five points of style. Now, the only thing that we're doing is, uh, for the bullseye, they must be feet down first and into that ball to get that extra 15 points. After all the spray has settled, it's once again the Australians who dominate the sport. Of the 10 top finalists, five are Aussies, and who do we find at the top of the list? Why, Steve Moyes, of course. Four-time world champion and without a doubt, the best of the best.